Welcome to How to Cook That. I'm Anne Reardon and it's time for another episode of Debunking. And yes, in this episode, we will open up the concrete watermelon and see what's inside. We're also going to see if you can cook salmon in a dishwasher and can you pop corn on the cob in the microwave. But before I do those, I want to compile all the hacks you sent me from YouTube and TikTok on getting stains out of clothes and we'll see if any of them work. I've got a bunch of t-shirts here with little test squares so that we can put the exact same amount of staining substance on each one and compare what works best. First up we've got spaghetti sauce of course and once I've put it on all the shirts I'm then going to get a spoon and scrape it off which I think is what most people do. That's what I would do if I spilt something on my top. I wouldn't just leave a chunk on there. Now for some bacon grease and some mustard, it's always bad. And why not a circle of beetroot? Moving on to the drinks, we of course have to spill some coffee. That seems to be a very common stain, followed by some red wine and my favorite, hot chocolate. This brand new shirt is having a really bad day. And then we'll add some thick shake over on the side. For the adventurers out there, here's some mud. I find that really hard to get out. And some grass stains, of course. Anybody who has little boys knows that you need to be able to get them out. Now for some grease from the car. That's going to be tough to get out. And some blood. For the school kids, I'm going to paint some paint on the shirt because somehow it seems to manage to get on there. And some permanent marker. Let's make a nice little love heart there and see if we can get that off. A scribble of pen ink and some pencil shavings. Let all of those dry and we now have a nice artistically stained t-shirt. The question is will any of the hacks get these off or not? Let's start with the one from BuzzFeed Nifty. This first one says if you spill coffee on your shirt you should put vinegar on it then cover it in baking soda, get more vinegar on a toothbrush and give it a really good scrub. And then I assume we wash it as normal. So let's add some vinegar to the stain. Now vinegar is a weak acid and then we'll add some baking soda, which is a weak base. And see how that's bubbling? That's the reaction between the vinegar and the baking soda. When you mix together vinegar and baking soda, you get the bubbles of carbon dioxide gas, which is just a harmless gas that we breathe out. And the byproduct, the liquid that's left behind, is just water and a salt. So we've got carbon dioxide gas and a salty water, which I'm not sure how that's going to help getting the stains out. But you never know. Let's see. We now have to give it a scrub with more vinegar on a toothbrush, which makes more impressive looking bubbles, more carbon dioxide gas. Now, if you happen to spill red wine on your shirt, 5 Minute Crafts has the solution for you. They say that we should put it over a bowl, sprinkle it with salt, and then pour boiling water over the top, and then wash as usual. Now, there's looked brand new just from pouring the boiling water over it seemed to get it out straight away. My stain's been in there for a bit longer than it looks like theirs had so we'll see if that's effective. Add the salt then pour on the boiling water. That has definitely got some of it out from around the edges. Here's the before and after but there is still that stain in the middle. We'll have to wait and see if that comes out in the wash or not. For mustard stains, Cleaning Solutions Channel tells us to get some baking soda and vinegar, sounds familiar, and dish soap and mix those together, put it on top and scrub it with a toothbrush. This is the internet solution to stains. I can do that. Scrub it up, dub and we'll see how that comes up in the wash. Now what about permanent marker? Is there a hack for getting permanent marker off clothes? Of course there is. BuzzFeed Nifty says that if you get it within three hours, you can coat it with a highlighter, then add baking soda and lemon juice and rub it with a toothbrush, of course, and then let it sit for five minutes and wash in hot water and magic, it's like a brand new shirt. So let's give that a go. This one I have put the permanent marker on just within the three hours so we can try it. Add the highlighter all the way around 
This seems like I'm adding more ink to the problem, but BuzzFeed's video showed it got it 100% out, so let's hope that happens. Add the baking soda and lemon juice and rub it with the toothbrush and then that can sit there while we do the other ones. If you have pen ink on your shirt, then don't worry. Housekeeper Channel has you covered with their hack. You and the million people before you who've watched this video. It says in the description here that ballpoint ink cannot be removed with soap and water. You'll need a special treatment for this. So let's see what the special treatment is. Vinegar, salt and toothpaste. Well, at least it's slightly different to the others. It's got toothpaste in there this time. <laughs> Scrub it with a toothbrush, which seems to be having no effect on the ink at all. Soak for 15 minutes. And when it comes out, the ink is totally gone. Now, is anyone else a little bit suspicious of this? The reason I'm a bit suspicious is this is what it looked like when it went into the water. And this is what it looked like when it came out of the water. That looks like a completely different bit of fabric with toothpaste smeared on it to me, but you never know, they may have just filmed the hack more than once and put it together poorly in the video so it looked like it was fake. It might actually work, so let's test it out. We've got the mixture of vinegar, salt and toothpaste and scrubbing it with a toothbrush. Next for blood, BuzzFeed Multiplayer says that what we need to do is get water and salt and scrub it with a toothbrush. And it says that salt loosens the blood stains and draws it out of the fibers. Well, let's try. Salt and water and a toothbrush and scrub. The rest of the hacks for stain removing are all very, very similar. It's basically add vinegar, then baking soda, and if you want some dish soap, and of course, scrub it with a toothbrush. That seems to be the internet solution for all stains. So that's what I'm going to do for all of the rest of them, except for the car grease. That one, I'm going to do something completely different that I haven't seen online and try just putting some oven cleaner on it. I honestly don't think anything's going to shift the car grease, but we'll give it a go with that and see if it helps. Now, earlier last year, I was asked to be in a TV commercial for a stain remover and that seemed okay to me, except for when I told them I don't lie. So the product would actually have to work. I can't show a new shirt if it didn't come out. When I said that, then mm, they didn't want to work with me anymore. So that made me very, very suspicious that maybe the stain remover ads are as genuine as some of the YouTube hacks that we see. So I thought, why not test the hacks against the stain removers and see what performs the best? Let's start with Messy Mouths Stain Treatment. This one is listed as one of the best sellers on Amazon. It says to wet the stain with water, then spray on and rub as needed. Now, because all of the hacks involved rubbing with a toothbrush, I'm gonna rub all of them with a toothbrush so that that actual motion of scrubbing it is gonna be equal amongst all of them. The only thing I want different is just what the stain remover brings to the table. Then it says to launder as usual. So for each one, I'm gonna use one tablespoon of laundry powder and the exact same wash settings. I'm gonna wash them all on their own so that any chemicals in one stain remover doesn't mix in the water of the wash into the others. I want them all on their own so we can actually see if they work. Next, we have shout spray. Just give it a quick spray there and a scrub with the toothbrush, of course. Fells naphtha soap says to wet the fabric and then rub it on the stain and then I'm going to give it a scrub with the toothbrush to make it equal. You might notice that a few of these turn the red wine from red into a deep bluey black color and that's because red wine acts as an indicator so we can see if it's an acid or a base. I can show you here if I add a base like some bicarb it will go darker but if I add more acid like a vinegar, it will bubble and react with the bicarb just like we saw earlier, but it also makes the wine change to a redder color again. The stronger the acid or the base, the stronger the color change will be. Next, we have Organic Choice Pre-Wash Stain Remover Enzyme Blend, then Sard Wonder Stick, 
Next one is OxyClean, which says it's America's number one versatile stain remover, and you can use it in several different ways. Now, one of them involves soaking it for six hours. Now, obviously I can't soak one shirt for six hours if I'm not soaking the others for six hours because that's a completely uneven experiment. The soaking could be what is effective rather than the stain remover itself. So I'm gonna use the other method they say for removing stains, which is just adding a scoop of it into the wash. One scoop in every load of laundry, it'll make your whites whiter. It'll make your brights brighter. As a stain remover, it's the best. Grass stains, clay stains, long live your laundry. So that one's easy. Next, we've got the Vanish Gold Gel. This one has a scrubber on the top, but I'm not going to use their scrubber. I'm going to use a toothbrush to keep it even and the same as all the others. And lastly, we need a control. So for this one, I've just got plain water and I'll dab that onto each one to make it damp. And then once that's done, I'll give it the toothbrush treatment, just like all the others. And then we can compare how effective or ineffective each hack and stain remover was. This is the control. After washing it, it had no stain remover, as you know, just went into the wash as normal. And this is what happened. The spaghetti sauce is gone. The beetroot, thick shake, pencil shavings and the paint are all gone. So those ones didn't even need a stain remover. I am surprised about the beetroot, but it just came out in the wash. The most stubborn stains were the coffee, red wine, hot chocolate, of course, the car grease, grass stain, mud, and the ink. The blood has dissipated, but you can still see a faint area where it was. So that's the control. Now what I'm gonna do is cut all the shirts up so it's easy to see the mustard stains next to the mustard stains for each shirt and each type of stain because it's very hard to compare with them all spread out across all the different shirts and then we'll know what's most effective for what. As you'd expect, the ones that the control got out were pretty good on all the shirts. Here's the beetroot and the pencil shavings. The bacon grease, that one is really hard to see on camera, but it does seem pretty good across all the shirts. The paint, that was water-based, so the control got it out without a problem, but interestingly, you can see on the sad soap one, it's still there faintly. Spaghetti sauce is gone for all of them, except the hack and the OxyClean, which is the one that I didn't scrub with a toothbrush because it didn't say to scrub it or rub it. I just chucked it in. I probably should have put water on it and scrubbed it with a toothbrush to make it equal to the control, but you'll have to keep that in mind when you're looking at it. The Thick Shake, this one was easy work for all of them. Didn't need a stain remover for that. And now moving on to the tougher stains. Let's start with the mustard. You can see the control didn't get out all the mustard and neither did any of these ones. The top row looked better, but it's still not perfect. If I spilled mustard, I would try any of these four at the top. Now for the blood stains, that's the control. And I'll order all of these from best to worst, going left to right, with the top row being the winners for that stain. You may notice that different stain removers rank better for different stains, and that's because the stains that we're trying to get out are made of all different materials, so some are gonna be more effective on different ones. For grass stains, a really important one, the control, the hack, and the oxy didn't touch it. These ones all faded, but the clear winner was Messy Mouths. For the mud, the vanish was a little bit better than the rest, definitely a tough stain to get out. For coffee, all of them still have visible staining. It's quite hard to choose a best because none of them are great. These ones here are the worst, and this one is slightly better, but it's still not good, and you can definitely tell that something's been spilt on it. For hot chocolate, the bottom row is still really stained. This row is looking a little better, but even the best one, you can still see a mark. What I find interesting in this group is that the control is the second best, which means for some reason, the stain removers seem to have set the stain into the fabric and made it harder to get out. It's made it worse. So with the control being second best, that would suggest that water is probably the best solution for hot chocolate stains. Moving on to red wine, this one was a disaster of a stain. Here's the control if you just chuck it into the wash. And to be honest, the whole bottom row looks very similar to the control. 
the top row seems to have faded it, but it is still there. These two have got rid of that spread, but the middle is still there. And the only one that seemed to make a significant difference and fade it was the shout. But the stain is still clearly visible, which makes me ask the question in this advert, it says for red wine to just spray, rub, wash, and it's done, it's perfectly white. Is this the same shirt? Is it a new shirt? Or did they just wash it immediately after they spilt the red wine on it? Because we all know that stains do come out the best if you wash them straight away and you don't let them dry out on the shirt, but that's not always practical. So I'm not sure about that one. Moving on to the crazy stains. If you get car grease on your shirt, none of these stain removers will get it out, but some will fade it slightly. And permanent marker, well, its name says permanent, and it's certainly doing a good job of being just that. This is the control, and you can see most of the others look very similar to the control, the exception being this one, which was the sard soap. It has changed its appearance. And this one, the hack. The red hasn't changed or shifted at all, but now we have a yellowy tinge around it from the highlighter. So definitely do not use that hack on your clothes. If you do happen to get permanent marker on something special, then get some paper towel and put it underneath the fabric, then pour on some nail polish remover and get another tissue or paper towel on top to quickly soak it out of the fabric and draw out some of that permanent marker. Keep doing that repeatedly until no more is coming off the fabric. Now you'll see that's faded it quite a bit, but it certainly hasn't got it out. So next you wanna wash that and rinse it, get all of the nail polish remover off it, and then put it in some lacquer thinner. Leave it to soak for about five minutes and then wash that out and even after all that you can still see the faint outline of what was written there so permanent marker is pretty permanent overall the hacks were one of the worst performing if not the worst performing <laughs> stain remover for the spaghetti the blood the grass stains the coffee and the mustard so probably not the best to try them. The only one worth trying was the one for the pen ink. That one actually worked. That toothpaste, salt and water mixture actually brought out the pen ink quite well. The ones that performed best in this test were the Vanish Gel, the Fells Napsa, the Messy Mouths and the Shout. And you can rewind back and see which ones worked best for which stains, depending what you've got stuck on your clothes. One more hack for removing stains that I did not try and I'm not going to try is a five minute crafts one. They say if you have a grass stain on your clothes, then you can squirt eco soap onto it and then just put it in a stream to wash clean. Eco soap is not safe for streams, lakes, rivers, the ocean. It's not designed for that. It can really upset the ecosystem. It can make algae bloom more than it should. Just keep all soaps, whether they're eco soaps or any type of soap, out of those natural environments. It's not good for them. Moving on, Andy asks, is it possible to cook fish in a dishwasher? I've seen some videos on YouTube sealing food in jars, then using the heat of dishwasher to cook it. This can't be good, right? And Jared says, this seems ridiculous. So let's have a look. In this video, Blossom's putting salmon into a broth and then into the dishwasher, then serving it up instead of using a sous vide machine. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me test it out so that we can talk about what happens together. I've got some stock and my piece of salmon and I'm putting a temperature probe into the middle of the piece of salmon so we can keep an eye on how the temperature goes. Obviously this is gonna vary a lot depending on how big your jar is, how thick your salmon is, but it didn't give us any measurements in their hack, so let's just see what happens. I've put this section of tubing on to protect the thermometer cable from the water in the dishwasher. And I'll turn the dishwasher on on the hottest cycle. Now on my thermometer probe, I'll select fish, which says it will be done at 63 degrees C or 142 F. 
That is the temperature we're trying to get it to in order to one, cook it, but two, kill any bacteria that is on the fish. If you're talking chicken and other things, there's different temperatures, but we're just focusing on fish for the moment because that's what we're testing. So you have the cold zone down the bottom, and when it's in the cold zone, when it's in the fridge and it's nice and chilled, the bacteria doesn't multiply very much, but you should always assume that there is some bacteria. It's very hard for there to be no bacteria. You don't have sterile food. So assume there is some bacteria on it. Once you bring it up into that warm danger zone, that's the temperatures bacteria like to multiply at and they can multiply quite rapidly. And the more there is there, the more likely it is to make you unwell or get food poisoning from it. So we don't want to keep it in that danger zone, but obviously we've got to go through that to get it into the hot zone. We want to get it up to 63 degrees and keep it there for at least 15 seconds and then serve it immediately. You don't want to let it cool back down. And you might be thinking, but wouldn't you have killed the bacteria if you got all the way up there? Well, yes and no, there's different types of bacteria. So some bacteria can form spores, which are heat resistant. So it goes all the way up to the hot zone. You've killed the bacteria, but the spores are still there. If you bring it back down into the warm zone, those spores can then germinate and multiply. So you wanna serve it as soon as it gets hot. Now our fish is unfortunately, it just falls short. Now let's imagine for a minute that it had gone hot enough, it had gone into the, the 63 degrees for 15 seconds. Well, at that point, you could probably pull it out and eat it, but without the temperature probe, you'd have no idea where that point is. And if you kept opening the dishwasher to measure it, it's not gonna reach that hotter temperature because it's barely getting to that temperature as it is. And then you can see the temperature dropped off and then it's picking up again. That will be the final rinse cycle, but it certainly doesn't get it hot enough. So we can take that out of the dishwasher. And the problem here is it's going to look like it's cooked. It's gonna taste like it's cooked. The cooking isn't the issue. The bacteria levels are what the issue is. So let's not cook food in the dishwasher. Now in their video, they compared this hack to cooking in a sous vide machine. If any of you have a sous vide or you've seen one before and you're familiar with it, you might know that food is cooked at a lower temperature than normal. They don't necessarily bring it up to that 63 degrees. So how is that okay with food safety and bacteria and everything I've just told you? Well, there's a couple of differences, well, three really between dishwashers and sous vide machines. I can't believe I even have to compare these two. <laughs> but number one is in a sous vide, you have to vacuum pack the food. So you're eliminating the air and eliminating the oxygen a lot of bacteria needs oxygen for it to replicate. So it needs food, it needs the nice warm temperature, and it needs oxygen. So getting rid of the oxygen means it's not going to multiply and replicate. The other difference is a sous vide machine, of course, has a controlled thermometer temperature, so you know what temperature the water is in the sous vide machine. You're still supposed to use a thermometer probe to know what the internal temperature of the food is, because the times given are from when the food comes up to temp, not from when the water is at the temperature. The next and final difference is the length of time that it's held at that temperature. So it's kind of more like pasteurizing the food rather than your normal traditional cooking, where we bring it up quickly to that hot temperature, hold it there for 15 seconds and we're done. This is bring it to a temperature that is going to really bother the bacteria and hold it there. For example, if we were cooking a piece of meat at that sort of lower temperature, about 55 degrees centigrade, you'd need to hold it there for 90 minutes. So an hour and a half in a sous vide machine in order for that to get to the point where it's pasteurized. It's not a sous vide machine, it's a dishwasher. <laughs> Do not cook your food in the dishwasher. Yes, it's hot, but no, not good for meat or anything like that, it's just not food safe. Moving on. Someone sent me this video asking if it's real. They take corn and put butter on it and heat it up in the microwave and you get popcorn on the cob. So is this real? Well, the answer is no and yes. <laughs> no, that video is not real, that's been faked. But yes, you can make popcorn on the cob in the microwave. If you get normal corn, the corn that you'd eat for dinner and you dehydrate it in a dehydrating machine or if you hang it up to dry for months and you put that in the microwave, you won't get popcorn. Let me show you what happens with that. 
After about 10 seconds, you start to hear a popping sound, but there's no popcorn. And if you look closely, you can see the kernels are puffing up back into the sort of full size. It smells a bit burnt, they're dry, and they're airy, they're easy to break off, and you can crush them between your fingers. They just crumble. That's actually really interesting. It's got these little kernels. <laughs> Tastes like corn chips. That's amazing. That's nice. Now I'm gonna try. Just for laughs and giggles, I'm gonna try, try one of the burnt ones because you all want me to. Ah, has like licking a fire. Oh, ah. Popping corn is a different variety of corn. This is what popping corn looks like when it's dry. It's solid and it's hard. I know it looks like fresh corn, but this is not fresh corn. It is totally solid. And as I said, it's just a different variety of corn. So now if we put that popping corn in the microwave, this is what happens. For the most part, the kernels come off the cob and then pop when they're just down on the plate in the microwave. But a few do pop while they're still attached to the cob but most get knocked off by other flying kernels. Now you are supposed to do this in a bag of course so that then you can collect all the popcorn easily but then I couldn't film it for you so I did it the messy way. It tastes like popcorn. That's pretty good. I like it. If you're a regular around here, you will remember that we wrapped a watermelon in concrete because this hack told us that if we did that, we could keep the watermelon fresh until New Year's. Well, it's been three months and I have the one that's wrapped in concrete. Of course, we also had a control and I kept one in the fridge for the three months and it's time to see what happened to it. All right, here we go. We have the control, let's cut. It's uh, still nice and firm, and let's find out what we have inside. Very juicy, looking pretty slimy. Oh, no, no, no. Ah. That would have to be the worst type of watermelon you could ever get. Texture is just like uh, jelly. Very juicy. Off. Gross. Rank. Yuck. Okay. Watermelon number two. This one has been stored in the fridge for months. Oh, it's spongy. You can see it's a little bit wrinkly on the outside. So I, I don't have high hopes. Ooh, slides on in. Wow, that was so easy. There ain't much left in this one. Oh, oh, actually looks quite pretty. Pretty rancid. Phew. Oh, it's quite firm. Hmm. Oh, oh, that's a terrible smell. Off watermelon is just bad. Uh, it's interesting with this one, the texture is quite firm. It's uh, like a little bit overripe watermelon, but uh, obviously the actual contents of it are long, long gone. That one's pretty rancid. So our last hope, it's not the fridge, our last hope is doing the extremely impractical exercise of coating your watermelon in concrete. Let's have a look if the hat worked. So you can see here that there's quite a few cracks in the cement. Uh, I don't know what that means, if it's weak or, or if it's gonna be easy to get into, but I'm pretty sure I need more than a knife. So I'm gonna put that aside. I'm gonna start with a little bit of a, a saw and we'll see how we go. Oh yeah, that's getting through. Everyone who's coming around has been really curious when they've come around to our house, that, you know, can, can we see the cement watermelon? 
the saw is getting stuck on the bandages that are inside with the cement. So I'm gonna take this up a level. We're gonna go up to the tomahawk. Look at that. Okay, here we go. This is like a uh, fruit ninja. <laughs> I'm getting sprayed with rancid watermelon juice. It's a bit whiffy. We have made a breach. We have a breach. <laughs> Not much of one. I'll try, I'll try this again. No, that ain't working. Scissors, please. I feel like a, a surgeon here. Wow. This is a very convenient hack, and I'm surprised that not everyone does this. Whoa. We're through. We're through. Interesting. Well, that ain't coming off. Um, I could have a look at what we got inside. Let's see. Ugh. Not on my Christmas shirt. Nope. No, I think we have officially I can't do it. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Freedom. All right, and here we are. Back to the knife. It slides through like butter. <laughs> what we have here is completely inedible. Smells disgusting. It's way, way gone. It's probably even worse than the other two, and it's covered in cement dust. So that's a complete bust. That hack is gone, done, never try it. With thanks to my patrons, here is a list of amazing, wonderful people, and you can click on the link to see how you can join them. If you like this video, make sure you let the algorithm know you did by liking, commenting, subscribing, turning on notifications, sharing with a friend, or watching more of my videos. Make it a great week by being kind to others, and I'll see you on Friday.